What's up, guys? Welcome back to Talking Nutrition, episode 45 today. I feel like today we have a very special guest on who's actually the kind of like the reason we're here, I guess, because this is how we, or we as in Christine and I met doing your program. So welcome, Sam Miller. What's up? I appreciate it, man. Yeah, it's been super cool. You guys actually linked up and then um, Kenneth and Laura have a podcast as well. And I think they connected through FNMS. So it's been super cool to see you guys, you know, do your own thing afterwards. And Johan, obviously I've known you for so long now that I remember when you used to not do public speaking, you weren't <laughs> doing videos, you weren't doing audio. And I see you now and I'm just like, man, you've come so far. Um, it's, it's really, really cool. So this is this was exciting for me and I've gotten to see you guys grow, which is awesome. Um, and it's even even better that, you know, we have these coaches supporting each other and creating content together, I think is awesome too. So I'm excited to be here and it's always fun, always fun to chat with you guys. Usually Johan and I, it's just like DMs back and forth here or there. So um, where we're talking about talking about animals and stuff, but uh, <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be good to talk nutrition today instead of, about, you know, talking about pets. We've changed it up, you know. <laughs> but that's true, though, because that's actually you, you guys both. So obviously, we met in FNMS. Sam, I think we started together. It was like my second month as a coach. I think I had just started, so it was like way in the beginning, you know. It was definitely way back. I mean, I remember you kind of, um, you know, transitioned. You're in Norway, tour guide, like CrossFit gym. A lot of stuff going on um had started nutrition coaching and then moving more online and kind of developing uh from there so it's definitely definitely a combination of growth in a lot of different areas but i think if there was one thing where you've made a complete 360 <laughs> is definitely the public speaking and showing up on camera and being able to to teach because because you had a lot of good information and ideas but it was like showcasing that i think where um, it's been super exciting to see and, and especially now that you're working in tandem with christine too I remember you were like, just fucking like, just hit record, just start talking. I had my whole, my camera roll, you know, it was like, <laughs> it just didn't just stop, practice, you know, man. just practice. It's like nobody, you know, it's like, it's like most of us, it's, you know, our first push up wasn't perfect squatting, deadlifting, whatever it was. It's like, you know, a lot of things, um, you know, just require reps. And sometimes you have a knack for things. You pick it up a little bit faster. Other things require a little bit more. And I think for you, once you started doing that, it's, I was like, you don't even have to post it. Just start, just record, talk, practice, <laughs> get into it. And you know, now you're on episode 45 of your show and you actually make reels and do different video content, doing public speaking. So it's really, I'm, I'm it's dying. Fun. Cause like we, me and Johan, I, I was telling him the same stuff when him and I started talking, I'm like, you just got to show your face. Like people love this stuff. And he was so awkward at the beginning. It, oh, was, it was like, Oh, and I was like, I'm like, I'm so proud of you, but this is so awkward. And then you progressed so quickly and started doing so well. It was great to see right from that point to now. It's been quite a difference. And the, lesson, the key takeaway for all the listeners is that's probably how you feel about your health, your fitness or your nutrition. Mm -hmm. Just like how Johan felt about getting on video. <laughs> and here's someone who knows all about health, fitness and nutrition and even talking about it, you know, maybe wasn't the most comfortable thing right away. And so a lot of us have that kind of initial starting point in our fitness journey where we're not feeling you know super comfortable. We're unfamiliar with certain topics or it seems like, you know, something's going to go wrong. And sometimes we just got to like, Take that first step. So yeah, yeah, exactly. always always parallels and connections back to the health and health and fitness journey. I feel like for mm -hmm. sure. And like the the main thing we wanted to talk about today was you know metabolism. And even there, I feel like people kind of they're like they think they're doomed. You know, I have a slow metabolism, or it's something that you can't change or fix. You know, well actually, let, let's not say fix, but change. <laughs> but. That being said, right, let's actually just start there. So what is the metabolism? Because I think, especially like still now these days, there's a lot of confusion. What is metabolism? Like explain to us. Sure. So the simple way that I kind of break that down for people is 
you know, at all times your body's sort of trying to regulate and account for energy and stress in your environment. And so as humans, we consume our energy in the form of food and that food contains calories and macronutrients. A lot of the things that you guys probably talk on and educate on regularly, but the way that kind of fits in from the system perspective is our body is sort of this miser of energy, right? It wants to make sure that there's enough around and, you know, the more active we are, or different changes in our lifestyle, it's kind of adjusting and accounting for those things. It's kind of rectifying that. It's kind of keeping things in balance. It's also especially perceptive and mindful of stressors, uh, which can come from a number of different things. And our body is just sort of hedging against those threats because that's really it's just its job from a basic survival perspective. And in scientific terms, it's kind of the idea of adaptive physiology or how we've sort of evolved um, just to make sure that you know we have this appropriate energy balance. And that's kind of how it plays into the weight loss conversation as well is when we begin to explore this concept of total daily energy expenditure you know, uh, expending calories versus, you know, the calories that we take in from food and our body is sort of what's, uh, determining the end outcome from that. But a key driver of that is really our choices and behaviors and the daily sort of routines and rituals that we engage in on, on a daily basis or basically practices and things that you do all the time. And so we've probably all heard going back to like elementary school, middle school, grade school, um, or maybe even from your parents or different family members like, Oh, so-and-so has a fast metabolism. They just can't keep any weight on or so-and-so has a slow metabolism. They just, you know, or, uh, you know, various terms related to people's ability to lose weight, gain weight, or maintain their weight. And that sort of creates a fixed mindset around the idea of metabolism, but the actual, um, crux of metabolism really at its core is it is quite adaptive and everything that we do and have done over our entire life has influenced uh, metabolism and where we are today, right? Whether that's spending time to build muscle in the gym, whether that's, you know, going for a walk today. So everything from, you know, health behaviors and health history and things that date back to years and years ago, uh, all the way to the choices we've made in terms of the sleep that we got last night to what we decided to do this morning, to even sitting now here recording this podcast, that all plays into metabolism. And what's super powerful about that is it means we have the ability to influence it. We have the ability to control it. We have the ability to make changes. Now, not everybody may experience the same exact change based on a behavior, right? I might go for a walk um, or begin resistance training and different people may have slightly different responses to that that we need to account for. And that's where coaching can be super powerful is like managing that stimulus, managing those variables. But what's super cool about it is it means like I can wake up tomorrow and begin to make choices that will improve my metabolic health. And so that's what I think is really, really awesome when you start to combine you know, the behavior aspect of it with the actual um, science of metabolism, nutrition, and our overall health. So cool thing is, you know, we can change it, but that also means we have to take responsibility for our actions, our choices, and the things that have played into our current health. And that can be kind of the scary part. That can be the tough thing to face in the mirror is realizing that like, wow, I really played into where I'm at currently. But once you realize that, it's incredibly powerful because then you have your whole life in front of you to potentially, you know, make a difference. And if you want to be in a different place, you know, you have the ability to do that um, either yourself or through like a coaching relationship where we're able to account for these different variables and steer things in the direction of whatever our goals are. Awesome. I think that's great. I think that's a, that's a good message too, because People often think that they're doomed. Like I said, it's kind of like, well, I have a slow metabolism, so I can't make the change, you know, because now that's just how it is. Well, no, there's actually a whole lot you can do. <laughs> but other than like the uncomfortable thing of like, like owning, you know, your actions basically from the past, we also then need to do the uncomfortable thing of like changing our habits and potentially eating more and actually working on like nourishing the body, you know, because, and this is something I didn't write down, but maybe we can get into this. We did an episode on the seasons of nutrition a little while ago, which I feel like we should touch on because that is one of those things that can actually help people like, hey, let's, let's say improve, not fix, but <laughs> improve their metabolism again so they can lose weight, you know? So tell us a little bit about that. So the seasons of nutrition and how you would kind of like take someone from continuously just trying to diet and diet and diet to a better spot so that you can actually lose weight. 
Yeah, so basically just the idea of planning different phases of where we want to spend time from a nutritional perspective, and that could be eating at maintenance calories, that could be eating in a slight surplus to support muscle growth, or maybe even pursuing a fat loss phase. And I think the challenge for a lot of you know coaches, and that's kind of how I met you guys, is we oftentimes get clients who come to us who have been dieting for a very long period of time, or basically they think that they are or they are attempting to. It doesn't always mean that they are successfully achieving a deficit, but it can still be quite cumbersome, fatiguing, annoying, challenging. Uh, you're spinning your wheels, you're not reaching your goals, and you're trying to hit that deficit. And then in the process, you know, we're not building as much muscle, we're not recovering as great. We end up on this hamster wheel where it's like we're under fueling and we're not maybe making as much progress with our fat loss as we would like. We're experiencing some metabolic downregulation because we are under fueling. We're also in consuming less calories, getting less micronutrients in, which isn't great for the body either from an overall just health perspective um, and bodily function perspective. So we kind of just like continue to follow this path and then progressive overload in the gym kind of changes because we're not, you know, showing up like fully fueled for these workouts. And we just kind of follow that cycle. It gets to be kind of a vicious cycle. And so you can use the seasons of, of nutrition or just any type of planning or periodization to kind of interrupt or disrupt that cycle of chronic dieting, which can be really helpful for people, especially if they've never spent time in other phases with their nutrition. And so while length of maintenance phases may vary, length of time in a surplus, depending on how much muscle you're trying to build or, um, you know, Christine, you have a history of like athletic performance and performance goals and doing things like CrossFit, you know, that's going to shift what we need to do in terms of fueling as well. Um, and I see a lot of people trying to kind of either like chase multiple rabbits or we're, you know, in a deficit, but like we're still highly active and doing all these other things. So that's going to influence what plays into that as well. But I just view it as a way to um, shift or kind of disrupt uh, you know, a history of chronic dieting and get the body back to a healthier place from like our metabolic status quo and internal health. So then when we move into a fat loss phase, we maybe have uh, a bit more success with it, or we can do it in a healthier fashion where it's a little bit more sustainable for the person to maintain their newfound weight loss or newfound body composition. Uh, a question that I want to ask or like touch on is this great debate that has been out there for a long time where like you hear people saying, oh, it's all about calories and no, oh, it's all about hormones. And obviously it's a little bit of both. Right. right. Um, but what is your, what are your thoughts on that? So I think when people are speaking about that conversation in our industry. The problem is, you know, they're, they're kind of these spicy topics, right? It drives attention in both directions. Most people who are in the social media sphere, it's like, we kind of, you know, whether we like it or not, part of the uh, survival of our content depends on engagement from the audience. Right. And so yeah. when you talk about these topics, it, you know, drives a wedge between people. Um, it's also, sometimes I think easier to take a black and white stance than to have this nuanced conversation, especially when you're constrained to like 2,200 words and a caption on Instagram or a 60 to 90 second Instagram reel. And so we end up having things that are either fall in the category of like clickbait or it's something argumentative that's meant to sort of generate a lot of traffic because that's how these pages kind of live and thrive. Or we just simply don't realize that we're speaking to different audiences. And so I think this is important for any health professionals who might be listening, but also if you're someone who's considering hiring a coach or you're just, you happen to follow uh, Christine and Johan, realize that like sometimes the balanced education is harder to come by also because depending on who you follow, they're speaking to very different people. Like if I'm a coach who solely focuses on individuals who want to lose, who have over 30 pounds to lose, that's a very different consumer then if I speak to the chronic dieter who has consistently been trying to be in a deficit for a period of time or has maybe successfully dieted before, but they didn't understand how to get out of that situation. So I guess first and foremost, understanding that health professionals may speak to different audiences and that's okay. If I have someone who's metabolically unhealthy, they're overweight and obese, excuse me, overweight and obese. We do need an energy deficit to improve their metabolic health because they're insulin resistant and they've overconsumed calories, maybe had a sedentary lifestyle, standard American diet. And there's a large percentage of the Western world that falls into that category, right? And so 
then when you have folks on the other side advocating for hormones and, and internal health and managing our physiology, that's not wrong either because even for the person who is metabolically unhealthy and overweight, their hormonal profile as a result of a number of things, having that excess body fat, systemic inflammation, insulin resistance, that changes our hunger, our cravings, our blood sugar regulation, our sleep. Um, you know, can, In terms of sleep, that can impact sleep apnea, impact our daily dietary decisions, the energy levels you have, everything that's going on in terms of your thyroid health, testosterone levels, and just round and round we go. Um, now, if we look at the flip side, let's say this is someone who speaks to people who have dieted before, they really probably only have like five or 10 pounds of body fat to lose, or they're just that type of person that's always trying to optimize body composition and performance. That person may need a little bit more education on things like hormones and understanding metabolic adaptation. What happens when we never move out of this uh, dieting phase or use seasons of nutrition? It's okay to educate on hormones because, you know, um, we've certainly seen a number of people in our sphere, in our environment, and also clients who experience things like gut health issues, digestive challenges, thyroid downregulation, sex hormone uh, imbalances, loss of menstrual cycles, where we need to be sensitive to the conversation around hormones as well, because it plays into our health, our quality of life, and really how we just show up as a person on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's a balance of both, because what we're eating, that's kind of these like prepackaged instructions for our metabolism in terms of the calories uh, you know, whether that's protein, carbohydrate, fat, and then the micronutrients that come with it, all of those things are influencing our, our metabolic health. And then that's like the energy inside. But when we look at the energy outside, that's influenced by hormones and even our daily dietary decisions, like my food consumption is impacted by my hormones. If I regulate my blood sugar, well, um, you know, even we have a hunger hormone ghrelin, right. And that's influenced by a number of different things. So, when people are arguing about it, it's oftentimes, number one, it drives attention to their accounts. It's kind of a thing that you know people are going to engage on. It's kind of like clickbaity in that sense. It is a little bit harder to have nuance around the conversation with these things. That's why I, I really like podcasts when it comes to nutrition, because you can have these more in-depth educational conversations. And then, you know, understanding, hey, it's okay if you speak to a different audience. Um, doesn't mean we need to disregard either one of these things, calories or hormones. And then I think kind of the fourth or fifth thing would just be, if we're really being honest about it, they both impact each other. Our hormones will impact what happens in terms of calorie expenditure and calorie intake. And what we're doing with our calories directly impacts our hormones because the calories that the food we're eating, you know, instructs our metabolism, basically what's going on, right? Am I eating um, a hypercaloric diet and I'm over consuming? Am I under consuming? Am I in that kind of like Goldilocks sweet spot where I'm getting the nutrients that I need and you know, maintaining my body composition? So they're really inseparable. And so when they're, when they are separated from each other in the conversation, uh, I would say it can be done professionally for someone who focuses either on a very specific audience or it's being done deliberately as like a marketing move more or less. Um, because it's, it's just easier to do that way and, and tends to get people's attention because it's a little bit of a hotter topic. Yeah, I was on YouTube the other day and I saw, the, I don't know if you know, like the diary of a CEO, like what's his name? Steven does it. And there was a guy on there and like the title was calories don't matter. And I'm like, well, that's not true, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it catches tough. people's I mean, attention. And, and then I think there's this vicious cycle, right? Because then it gets into like, well, then, you know, so-and-so health professional is going to call out this other fitness professional because they <laughs> said the calories don't matter. Or then, then like the holistic functional integrative health people get upset because they're disregarding hormones and saying, well, it's only calories in and calories out. And it's like, guys, like let's, if we spent less time arguing with each other and helping people like the world would just be a better place. So yeah. I, I think it's like, we're not going to reach that point of consensus, but the truth is, you know, our food and lifestyle decisions directly impact our internal health and our internal health and how we've made choices in the past and what's gone on with our food and our caloric consumption really impacts the current, you know, life that we're experiencing, the status quo, body composition, overall health markers that we have. Um, but it's, you know, for people who say that like calories don't matter. Well, if I eat a different amount of calories and you're saying that you're an advocate for internal health and hormone health, shifting, you know, that from a nutritional perspective 
those calorie and macronutrient changes will change your labs, right? Your serum labs will change, whether it's your fasting insulin, whether it's your fasting glucose, your lipid profile, your C-reactive protein, things will change. Um, you know, if I go up or down in, in energy consumption, total calories, I may see changes in thyroid, right? That thyroid's kind of an energy regulator. Then for the person who says, well, it's only calories in, calories out, and like hormones don't matter. Well, it's like, okay, cool. Change your your calorie, macro, and micronutrient intake, and then like let's go back and look at this report of what's going on. It's like we're going to see very direct changes in terms of someone's internal health. So, unfortunately, we are in a place in the industry where um, social media kind of gives people this megaphone to like broadcast certain <laughs> sort of ideas and feelings and opinions. And uh, you know that's why I I think it's cool that we have folks like you who are kind of having this more in depth conversation and, and telling people to take a step back and be like, hey, like you know, maybe there's something we can learn from this side. And maybe there's this other opinion over here that has some merit to it. And maybe we find a moderate answer in the middle, which, you know, the gray area is not always the sexiest thing. But I think the more that uh, we can do that with our own health, and then for you know, professionals who are kind of applying this information, it's always going to be kind of context dependent on the person. And that's where I think just we have to remember, it's like, at the end of that YouTube video, at the end of the Instagram reel, in the comment section, like there's a human receiving that, right? And like that human has a health history, that human <laughs> eats a certain way, they behave a certain way, right? It's like getting out of some of these like robotic, uh, you know, social media tendencies that I think we kind of have as we broadcast things. It's like, okay, cool, calories in, calories out, but like go apply it, like go try right. to like do this in the real world. Um, for someone who says hormones don't matter, I'm like, how, how, how does that person feel and how does that impact them showing up for their workouts, performing, recovering, progressive overload, sleep? Like if that person feels like trash, yeah, we know like going and getting steps is important. Getting your training in is important. The person with completely tanked values across the board is like probably not, you know, getting that optimal TDEE for the calories out portion because they're just like lethargic. They don't feel good, you know, and, um, Christine, I know you've kind of had a chapter of your health journey where you felt that way, but like yeah. it directly impacts your behavior. So, and behavior is like a key driver of the calories in calories out, um, equation. So I think it's like, we can come full circle with that. You can argue it a number of different ways, but at the end of the day, they're both important and they both matter. Um, but it's something people will probably continue to argue about for decades moving forward. <laughs> I think yeah. that's hard too, <laughs> because I mean, one, it, it doesn't help people to just go online and just like have arguments about shit all the time, you know? Yeah. But then also kind of like just making those claims, like, no, it's just calories, like just calorie deficit. And that's all the, like, that's the only thing that matters, you know? I mean, yes, you will lose weight and that needs to happen then, but there's so much more to it. And I don't think that's helpful. You know what I mean? Like yeah. give me some more context, you know, but that's also the tricky part because as you mentioned, it's so individual it's going to be completely different for someone who, as you said, you know, has been chronic dieting, for example, compared to someone who is overweight and maybe is just getting started or just trying to figure it out. There's so many different like people there, you know, individuals that it also becomes difficult to kind of like educate everyone. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then <laughs> the thing is like the shit that works, you know, like go for a walk, <laughs> get some sleep eat some veggies, like those kind of things. Like that's way less exciting, you know, for social media. So that it gets less attention. And then you're kind of stuck yeah. with all these kind of like extreme, you know, uh, like pages and profiles and, and channels to where it's always just kind of, like, kind of like making things worse. You know what I mean? Cause again, yeah, definitely, like, definitely contributes to the problem for sure. And it's not always, um, it doesn't seem magical to like go for a walk or get, get sleep. And it, some of those things require compounding efforts to yield the return. Mm. So it's like, I, I mean, maybe ex except for sleep, you could probably get a pretty good night's sleep and you probably feel a lot better the next day. So that's one of those things that that does show up a little bit more immediately. Um, I would like to think, you know, going for a walk outside or being in nature, those, those do have some pretty tangible metrics behind them to show their efficacy. Like if we look at it actually in terms of research, but yeah. I think that's why it's important as a health professional, like you can share both types of content, but also as far as the people that we're, we're working with, I think when we're clear on that and we understand, and also when, um, we, we advocate for consumers to, to be educated and to learn and to sort of ask these questions, I think it's super important. And the more that 
um, you know, we continue to kind of like make a dent in the industry and, and talk about these things. I think, um, it does have a compounding effect, like having more voices kind of magnifies, magnifies that theme and just shifting the focus is like at the end of the day, I think for all of us as professionals, like the end, the end goal should really be like the, the person receiving the message, uh, even more yeah. so than, than us. And a lot of those folks that, that kind of revert to those arguments or like ad hominem attacks on each other. It's like, you're really just making it about you. You're not making it yeah. about the person and their results. It's like, you're, you're channeling the attention onto your personal public image. And at the end of the day, it's like, I understand why people might do that, but is that really uh, helping more people? I, I mean, maybe some people find that entertaining to where they click on it and they learn something that's certainly possible, but I don't know that it uh, necessarily is like a rallying cry for folks to like come, come behind something. So I definitely agree with you, Johan, you know, going for a walk um, regardless of, regardless of the calories that we're eating or the foods that we choose or whether you want to be plant-based or you follow an animal-based diet or you're omnivorous, there are some basic things that we can all do. I'm actually kind of working on um, a proposal and presentation that, that's related to these things. It's like we we take for granted how going for a walk, getting sunshine, going to sleep on time, um, even spending time with pets. Like I know we all have kind of joked around that, <laughs> joked around about that at the beginning of the podcast, but like animals, uh, nature, sunshine, sleep, stress management, and even regardless of the food you choose to put in your mouth, like I don't even need to argue about that. Like you, you do you and what feels best for you. And I'm going to do my thing. And like, um, you know, if Christine goes hunting and like, I want to eat something that she, that she brought back, <laughs> like, let me do my thing. Uh, but, but even how we show up at mealtime, right? Like attentive eating, like not having Netflix on, like putting, you know, being with, a loved one or a friend or a community member or like a, even a pet, like if you want to eat with your pet, that's cool too. But like attentive eating, chewing your food, regardless of the food that you choose, like there's still so many basic like lifestyle changes that are so powerful. It's like really why um, I always kind of come full circle back to this like nutrition and lifestyle medicine is whether we're trying to achieve a body composition goal, performance goals, health goals, longevity. It's like there are some key cornerstone things that we can all be doing that we can all agree on, right? Like yeah. resistance training when dosed appropriately is, is good for ever. Like I will, I will like definitely like push that forward as like movement as medicine there from that perspective, like going for a walk is a net positive for just about everyone in the human race um, or some form of low grade movement, right? To, within your ability level and like what you can do um, with your physical means getting to sleep on time, stress, like there are some universal truths that I think we can fall back on. And then, yeah, it's like energy is a key pillar of like managing metabolism and whether your goal is weight loss or muscle building, we need to account for it. But there's a lot of different tools as far as like how we can get to an end result. Right. And I think that's just accepting that like, we may not all have the same exact journey. Uh, we may not pick the exact same tools and things to get there, but along the way, there are some things that we can all kind of do that are um, key drivers of health across the board. And then there's personal preferences. Like you might enjoy the flavor of certain foods or it works really well for managing your appetite, for managing your blood sugar, for helping you achieve that calorie deficit or surplus, whatever you're trying to do. And leaving a little bit of wiggle room for individuality because we're humans, we are individuals with personalities and preferences. That's cool. And then it's like, all right, but there are probably, you know, five to 10 things uh, that we can all benefit from and, and utilize regardless of our transformation goal. Oh. So you mentioned stress a couple times and stress management. I feel like that's, that's one that's definitely becoming like more known. I feel like and stress management is like a big buzzword now. Um, but how does it impact the metabolism? So we talked about the calorie side of things, how about stress or how does that kind of play a role there? I'd say probably some of the most obvious ones would be, you know, when we are highly stressed, it's putting us in what's called more of a sympathetic or fight or flight state. It's not optimal for sleep and recovery. So if you're someone who emphasizes your training and you really want to be performing optimally, we need that balance there, right? We've all had that day where something's on our mind. It keeps us up at night. We're a little bit wired and tired. We can't quite, quite go to sleep. We're a little restless. We know that compounding over time we are sleep deprived that imp impacts our insulin sensitivity. And, you know, when we don't get a great night's sleep, 
we may be making some different daily dietary decisions when we show up the next day, right? Like we're a little bit hungrier or maybe our, our, our focus and like dedication towards our goals might shift ever so slightly. So I think that's, that's one key thing as far as digestion, stress can definitely move people in different directions, whether that's, um, towards constipation or maybe like excess motility or going to the bathroom a bit too frequently. Stress also decreases our stomach acid. So a very important aspect of breaking down our food is uh, stomach acid plays a really big role in terms of breaking down food like proteins. So stress uh, impacts that. It depletes key micronutrients, which are necessary for uh, overall metabolic function and our overall health. So whether that's key minerals or B vitamins, like when we're stressed, we are depleting that. Um, and that is very important for our overall health and well-being. And stress in itself is kind of catabolic. So if you're trying to build uh, you know, a good amount of muscle, if we're in kind of this state of fight or flight, that's not really the best for muscle building or digestion. So now we're not like absorbing and assimilating those nutrients quite the same. And it's less protective of muscle, right? So stress is inherently a little bit more catabolic versus anabolic. Uh, we need to be a little bit, we need a little bit more anabolism when it comes to building muscle or if we have performance goals and things like that. Um, if stress continues, we have elevated cortisol or inflammation in the body, it impacts thyroid conversion. So in order for us to have optimal thyroid levels in terms of the metabolically active hormone that circulates and then, and then sort of binds to this receptor in the body so we exert the effects of the powerful hormone, we need stress levels managed and inflammation managed in order to convert that optimally. So if stress runs rampant, if the body is highly inflamed, if we have micronutrient deficiencies, so for example, like zinc or selenium, those are key minerals, that can begin to show up in terms of uh, the function of some of these hormones and what's happening in terms of the enzymes that play a very, very important role in different reactions uh, that impact that metabolic status quo that we have. So stress can impact decision making for sure. We know that like there's a certain reactivity that happens when you're stressed. That's why I think it's important to work with clients on their resiliency. And another reason I'm a huge proponent of resistance training is I think it really does help us kind of buffer in those, res in those responses to stress. Stress can definitely impact our sleep. And then from that hormonal perspective, we know that stress plays a role in terms of what's going on with blood sugar regulation, muscle building, um, you know, I mentioned the sleep cascade and things that can happen there. And then also our digestion and regulation of appetite. Yeah, we were kind of going to go into that, the effects of chronic stress on hormones and gut health and the down regulations you can see there. Yeah, for sure. So from a gut health perspective, when we do have chronic stress, I would say some of the biggest things are you know, the stomach acid component, the, when we see those changes in thyroid that I mentioned that can certainly impact motility. So if you're starting to see constipation or, uh, potentially someone going to the bathroom very frequently, but especially constipation, we end up, uh, instead of excreting some things that are supposed to be leaving the body, sometimes we have recirculation, like for example, estrogen can get kind of recirculated. That's not great for hormonal balance, especially in females, but really the gut, the gut side of things, certainly spent a lot more time in recent years diving into this and even some of the precursors to our stress hormone cortisol. So like the signal from the brain to the adrenal glands, we actually see how some of these precursors and cortisol itself can impact intestinal permeability um, and overall like gut barrier function, the health of the gut, motility, stomach acid. And then when we have sort of this compromised gut state, whether it's an imbalance in bacteria or we have that permeability, things that are supposed to stay in the gut don't stay in the gut. They activate the immune system and that actually further perpetuates that fight or flight response that we're having. So it's like we have this external life stress or like perceived stress that's going on that our physical being is seeing and experiencing emotionally or from a mental perspective. And then on the inside of the body, what's going on in the gut and from a hormonal perspective is exacerbating, you know, we basically have these underlying stressors that are going on with our internal health. So this is where, you know, being cognizant of, of that balance for both clients or anyone who's kind of a health enthusiast in their own transformation is understanding like the stress on my body is not necessarily limited to getting like a stressful email from my boss or a client or a conversation or like your mom annoyed you in a text message, right? There's like other stressors that can be going on, especially from an internal health perspective. And this is also true of, we use the example of someone who maybe lives a sedentary lifestyle has over consumed calories before just their blood sugar regulation or inability to reg regulate that blood sugar and insulin resistance. That is actually a stressor on the body as well. So it plays both directions. It's not just kind of that 
person who's like going to the group workout classes 17 times a week and under fueling. It's like, we also have those stressors from the person who has uh, engaged in that sedentary lifestyle, maybe over consumed from a caloric perspective, not paying attention to micronutrient density. That person also has a lot of oxidative stress going on too, because we're lacking the appropriate micronutrients to create some of our body's most powerful antioxidants. So when it comes to our metabolic health, definitely, you know, gut health, um, hormones, oxidative stress, all of those have, uh, this, this very closely related, you know, sort of, uh, closely related factors that are playing into our ability to achieve our results. It may seem a little bit indirect on the surface, but when we dive deeper, we realize like, okay, if this is impacting how I feel and this is impacting how I show up on a day-to-day -day basis, it can impact my decisions and that can impact what's going on with my progress related to my weight loss or building muscle, uh, or even, you know, quality of your sleep and some of the things that are going on in the background of a transformation as well. Yeah. I think a lot of people, when they, when they think stress, they think like one thing, like you touched on this, they think like maybe it's work stress, right? But they don't think about it being dysregulated blood sugar. They don't think about, you know, all these other things, whether it's overeating or undereating, the quality of their food, if they're sedentary, you know, dose, dosing of training, right? A lot of people too, like when they're really stressed, they don't realize that like training for some people can still be an added stress to the system, right? So they, a lot of time they just think of it as like emotional stress when it's so, it can be so many different factors coming into play there. And that's when it's, I feel it's so powerful to have a coach to be able to educate people and say, okay, like we're seeing all of this different stress. We're like, they're just seeing one and where we can adjust, you know, wherever we need to adjust to get them, um, feeling better. Yeah. And I would classify that, right? Like it's just different ways that we're sort of placing some additional strain or burden on yeah. our body. And I don't expect clients to be an expert in like human physiology or biochemistry or any of those things. But if we can begin, you know, as much as like stress is definitely a loaded word and most people associate it more with emotional and psychological stress, mm -hmm. it can be a helpful way to explain like, Hey, what's going on in your body it, it kind of can work against us to some degree and make it feel like we're kind of swimming upstream with some of these health and fitness goals. So by rectifying that and getting to kind of the bottom of what's going on, finding the root cause of some of these stressors and, and underlying yeah. body burden, we can make it a little bit easy. It's not necessarily easier right away, but then when we're actually achieving some results, we can make things more sustainable. And also you're going to feel a lot better in the process as opposed to experiencing this resistance, kind of feeling like garbage and still trying to muscle your way through, like willpower your way through. Um, because I mean, honestly, some clients are great at that. And even earlier on in my own health journey, like I would be the type of person that would just like continue to try to just like push, 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 push. And I think helping clients understand that while there are different things that play stress, that do play stress on the body and may be emphasized at different times, like you may be going through a season of life where, hey, maybe you're sleeping less because you have a new baby at home, or maybe your sleep is great, but you have a lot of conflict in your personal relationships, or you have some job stress, or you're like moving across the country for some reason. Like there's all sorts of different things that people may experience. And so I think being sensitive to that as a coach and health professional is super important. And even clients giving themselves a little bit of grace and understanding like, even though it doesn't seem that it's directly in your health and fitness bucket, right? Because a lot of people think like gym, nutrition, macros, like this is the buck, this is my fitness bucket and everything else ex exists like separate from that. Mm -hmm. Giving yourself a little bit of an under, you know, that understanding and that space to say, you know, hey, this may be impacting what's going on in terms of my overall health. And I need to work on this and incorporate this into my journey because, you know, by paying attention to it, I can ultimately resolve some of this underlying stuff, whether that's, you know, you've got stuff going on and people say, oh, well, like, how is my gut health like really related to my fat loss? Like, it's just me going to the bathroom or it's just this and the other thing. But if it's impacting the absorption and utilization of nutrients, if you feel uncomfortable, also in your progress photos, if you're feeling bloated or distended, there's a lot of aspects impacting both your quality of life and your visual appearance, yeah. right? So I think acknowledging how those things can kind of play out is super important. And clients also realizing the interconnected nature of like, 
this health and fitness journey and nutrition stuff is part of your life. It's so if you have stress going on in other areas, you know, your macros don't exist in isolation independent of that. Some people are very good about being kind of robotic and blocking that out and just like hitting things to a T or maybe they have experience with like competition prep of some kind, whether that's, um, you know, for a sport like CrossFit or maybe it's something like bodybuilding, very good at putting the blinders on and doing that. But just because you do that doesn't necessarily mean that it exists in a vacuum, right? It's still so interconnected with the rest of uh, our lives. And one of uh, the other coaches who's actually kind of been through the program after you guys, we were doing, we were having a conversation after the fact and he kind of mentioned, he's like, yeah, I really like how you guys like take a 360 <clears throat> approach to things of like the client's life. And I was like, that's perfect because sometimes I feel like the word like functional health doesn't really hit the nail on the head. And there's so many like arguments around it. And I don't really always love like the word holistic because it sounds kind of like we're like yeah. lighting incense in the background. like while <laughs> yeah. <things> nutrition. <laughs> So I really liked it when it's like, Hey, we're taking a 360 view of this client transformation of this health yeah, journey. Like that. And so with the 360 view, it's like, yeah, I'm looking at your life. I care about your job stress. I care. Like, do you have a 18 month old that's keeping you up at night. So your sleep is not optimal. So we need to dose your training differently. Like Christine mentioned that point earlier, which I think is huge. You know, do we need to dose the training differently? Is there something that, you know, you've, you've been traveling a lot for work and so you have some jet lag and that's throwing things off from like a circadian health perspective. It's really taking that full picture and then figuring out within our locus of control, within the things that we actually have some influence on, what behaviors can we adjust and dose appropriately that are in alignment with your goals, right? That's kind of, that's really where the coaching conversation um, ends up going. And that's why I'm a huge proponent of really looking at this whole health journey and health coaching as really more of like, we're just trying to intelligently manage adaptation because when there are stressors and there's stimulus to the body, the body's going to adapt. It's like, that's what bodies do. That's what, even coming back to the beginning of today's conversation, we talked about metabolism. Like what is metabolism? Metabolism is like this adaptation machine that's adapting to energy and stress and stimulus. So as coaches, our job is really how do we sort of best manage and observe the adaptations taking place and then steer things accordingly, whether it's a nutritional change. This person needs some carbohydrates or they need some more protein. We need to change the frequency of resistance training. Maybe we need to go for more walks or maybe we need to get more sleep. It all becomes intelligently layering those things and kind of creating the recipe for the client that works best. Um, and I think once we get to that place, it's just, that's really where things are. Uh, we kind of like unlock some superpowers and it can be really helpful for the client because instead of feeling like there's this, um, you know, lack of understanding of how things work and how to actually sustain and like achieve those results that they're looking for. They understand how things come together. And I think that's super powerful because now not only have we made, you know, like a six month fat loss goal a reality, but now like six years from now and like decades that follow this person now has the appropriate sort of health behaviors under their tool belt to actually like be autonomous for the rest of their life, which I think is really, really important and oftentimes missed by some of those like quick fix approaches that we all see on social media. No, I, I feel like with the, with the quick fix approaches, like with, with the meal plans and, and the supplement, you know, schemes and all that stuff, like, can you lose some weight short term? Like, yeah, but it goes way beyond that. You know, it should go way beyond just like that calorie update or, you know, your macros and once a week, here's your app and, you know, a couple of new recipes. I just had a chat with someone yesterday on the phone and she hit me up. She's like, I really feel like I fucked up. You know, I didn't hit my targets. I, you know, I'm struggling with this, whatever. So I was like, no, you didn't fuck up. Like, let's actually have a conversation about this, you know, like, and then we ran into just different scenarios. It was like, you know, she had kids and she's very busy, basically just on the run, like all day, you know, then they were going away for the weekend. They were going camping. She didn't know what to do there. So all those things like that all plays a role there and that's all stuff that we need to cover you know and we can't just say hey these are your macros good luck figure it out <laughs> you know which i do feel like a, a lot of programs are still doing you know but we need to look at everything we need to look at those stressors we need to look at how busy you are like what can you actually do and sometimes also like remove stuff right because that's a lot you know what stress management is like let's actually remove a little bit of stress <laughs> if we can at least, or at least do more of what recharges us. Cause I think sometimes, and I know you, you guys have run into this too, but like, 
I feel like sometimes people almost react by adding fuel to the fire, right? To where, oh, I'm not losing weight. So I'll have to do another run, right? Or I'll have to do another hard workout. Well, on the other hand, we might actually just have to just chill a little bit more <laughs> and try to calm yeah. down, you know? Yeah, kind of pulling back and do less. And I just to kind of emphasize a point you made there about camping or having a busy schedule, I think with clients and also in the coaching relationship, allowing those people to view that aspect of their journey as a learning experience and like, okay, this didn't go as planned this time, but what did we learn for next time? Like it's a clue of how we can modify, modify things, iterate off of, Hey, this was my initial plan. And man, was I, I was like totally off on that. I was totally wrong on that. And it's some of the, you know, there's a lot of parallels to like business and life where sometimes we have these ideas and we think that they might be successful initially. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. And a lot of our success is dictated by our ability to respond to those challenges and respond to that adversity or when things didn't go our way. Because the client who's like, well, I really had this intended plan for camping, didn't really go that great. What did I learn from it? And then they come back on Monday or Tuesday and they just go back into what they know works for them. And they, um, you know, they time block, they get on a schedule, they prepare some meals or, or they figure out a way to build momentum and, and get back into the swing of things. That person's the one who's going to be successful. Like they, they learn from it. They acknowledge that there was a mistake, but they gave themselves some grace. They kind of fail forward in a way. And then they begin to iterate on it of like, okay, how can I do better next time? Um, versus, you know, a lot of, and I think this is also a problem in terms of coaching is like clients almost expect like this very critical approach from the coach or like, Hey, this was wrong. Or you did that. Like this was off versus viewing it as an opportunity of where you can grow, where you can change things, how we can iterate. Well, how would we maybe do this differently? You can scenario, you can walk through different scenarios. You can plan, you can, um, almost like an if then approach to things. Right. So, Hey, if you guys go camping again over, so in the States, um, Christine, you know, we got a Memorial day coming up and then there's like 4th of July and labor day and all the things after that. Um, you know, Johan, a lot of your clients right now, it's like, there's way more daylight for you guys. People have more activities and, you know, they're getting out more and they probably have a lot more social commitments and obligations than they had previously versus when it was like super dark for part of the year. So now all of a sudden people are bustling and like schedules are busy and things are going on. Maybe kids have stuff going on too. And accepting that like, okay, the approach that I used in this specific season of life might be different than the approach that I need to use right now. That doesn't mean that I'm like a total screw up. It just means we need an adjustment, right? And uh, it, it, it's instead of viewing myself as like a flawed human for making that mistake, it's understanding like, okay, I'm not going to play victim to my circumstances. I'm going to view this as an opportunity for me to grow and make modifications and adjustments and then plan. So if I know six weeks from now, I'm about to do a very similar trip to what I just did over that long weekend, I can then make an adjustment knowing that like, okay, this is what I set out to do last time. Didn't really work. So I'm going to need to adjust accordingly. So I think that can be super powerful for people. Um, and I love that you sort of mentioned things not going to plan and then the, oh, I got to do more. Well, not necessarily, right? We don't, we don't always necessarily need to do more um, just because something was uh, missed or omitted or forgotten or maybe you didn't hit your exact targets, right? Sometimes it's, it's getting back to that formula of the things that we know that work or working to establish and identify Hey, why didn't this work? And just being able to have an open conversation about it um, in a non-critical way, just kind of bringing self-awareness, I think, to empower future decision making. I love if-then planning. I use it all the time. <laughs> so <Same>. good. <laughs> it's the best. That's uh, literally like that conversation we had yesterday. That's literally what we did. And we just said, okay, let's let's come up with the if-then plan so that mm -hmm. next time you go, you just kind of know what's up, you know? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I think we, we touched on a lot of good points. Anything else you wanted to mention, uh, Christine? I don't think so. I think we, uh, we have a lot of good stuff. So that being said, dude, thank you for, uh, for coming on. We Appreciate finally made it happen. <laughs> yeah, I know. We, I, you guys were on my list and, and to be fair, <laughs> I did do like a podcast hiatus when I was finishing the book. So I yeah. pretty much went like, underground for a minute. Oh yeah. And I love, I love doing podcasts. I love guest speaking. I love doing those things, but I had to almost restrain myself 
And then even once the book was kind of finished, you have the the time period where you're either promoting things or you realize like, crap, I still have all these other areas of my business that still need <laughs> TLC in addition to living in front of a Google Doc for an extended period of time. So um, I, I think you guys are actually one of other than my, I, we talked about the muscle for life interview and things like yeah. things like that. I think this is, I can count on one hand, the amount of podcast interviews that have taken place since November of last year, mm. um, with everything. So it was a lot of fun and, you know, it's extra special because I've known you guys for a while and, and Johan, like seeing your growth and Christine, you as well. And then even how you've kind of evolved in your approach and sharing and content communication mm. is super, super cool. So I was, I was excited to be here and be part of the conversation and hopefully provide people some insight on nutrition and metabolism and, you know, give them some actionable tips for things that they can do in their lives. Awesome. awesome. That being said, where can people find your book? So the book is available at metabolismmadesimple.com. Uh, but I do share a ton of free content too. So if books, you know, if a book's not your style, uh, I have, uh, my Instagram and podcast are both similar science. I'm similar science on just about every platform. I have some blogs as well at samularscience.com. Those are totally free, no cost content for you guys. Uh, the book, if you go to metabolismmadesimple.com, it'll kind of reroute you to whatever the best, um, you know, based on like you landing on that site, you'll just kind of put in your name and email and then it'll bring you to the best place for you to buy that book if you want to. There are both hard, uh, soft cover, hard cover and Kindle versions available. So if you are like part of Johan's audience, uh, there's a chance like you may potentially be able to grab like hard or soft cover. But if not, we got you covered with the Kindle version uh, on Amazon as well. So lots of different ways to potentially learn and then um, share the podcast, which is a good mix. Certain episodes are a little more geared towards health professionals, but we do have some general content that if you're just super into health and fitness, you can benefit from as well. And then I'll share some occasional like silly skits and random memes and stuff on, mm -hmm. on Instagram. So if you need something a little bit lighter, you can cut over that way as well. Love it. Usually it's just stepbrothers and uh, and dogs, I think. <laughs> I, there's a lot of dog photos, but it's just kind of, you know, I think it lightens lightens the mood totally a little bit. It's does. like sometimes when you talk about serious stuff like I do, you you need a little bit of that balance in order to oh, yeah, for sure. you know, connect with people. And I I am partial to like my late nineties, two thousands to like <laughs> twenty foot like it's interesting, right? Because we'll and we'll totally end on this. I don't need to like make this into a 20 minute <laughs> bit. But what I realized is that in, in starting a business and, and being like so immersed in the health and fitness industry, I hadn't seen relevant movies from like 2015 to 2023. So there's like an eight year gap of like, there's really, unless it was a series and I went back and I, I viewed it, I missed a ton of stuff. So a lot of my references end up being like whatever was like high school, college, grad school, and like early adulthood for me. So there's definitely a little bit of a gap, but if it happened between like 2005 and 2015, there's probably a good chance there's going to be a quote, you know, from something. And fortunately, a lot of people in kind of our age group, like recognize some of those classics. So it's a little bit easier. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely a little bit, definitely a little bit of Step Brothers that pops up in there, but that's just, you know, you can't like take Will Ferrell too seriously. So makes it a yeah. little bit easier. No. I have been trying to mix in. I mixed in some dodgeball the other day. Got some dodgeball. <laughs> so through, and, uh, I had Napoleon Dynamite in one of my videos the other day. So I'm trying to broaden, you know, for everybody's sort of different comedic flavors that they may have. But just if you do make it to my page, just know that. I apologize. I missed out on a lot of movies when trying to kind of uh, <laughs> do this whole health and fitness thing. So there's, there's like, I'll get caught up eventually, but there's like almost a decade gap in my uh, comedic <laughs> chairs that I have. <laughs> love that. Let's end it on that. Dude, keep sharing the classics. We actually love that stuff. So <laughs> all good. I appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me. Dude, thanks for coming on again. Yeah, of course. And uh, to the listener, we will talk to you again next week. <laughs>